Hi, welcome. I'm Nick Bonner for TreeStuff.com, and we're bringing you another webinar tonight in our series. We've got Joe Aiken from ArborJet here doing Defining Evergreens. Joe's a regional technical manager with ArborJet and has been on our webinar series several times presenting on a various a variety of topics from the history of arboriculture to all sorts of plant healthcare related things. And a huge thanks to Joe and the whole team at ArborJet. They've been really helpful with us growing the webinar program and have shown that they have a lot of expertise within their organization and that they're willing to show it. So we very much appreciate that. I know the audience appreciates it. And uh, yeah, big thanks to ArborJet. So tonight we're going to talk about a lot of stuff related to evergreens from how to look at them, how to evaluate them, how to place them, how to plant them, how to care for them. So stay tuned. There will be a quiz at the end. You will get two CEUs with a passing score. The link will be posted in this chat and in another post on the main Facebook page. So just click the link, uh, put in your information and take the test. You do not need to be a certified arborist to take the test. You can do it just for fun if you want and there's instructions on the form. Uh, this is our 15th webinar for the year. Really just over the moon excited about that. I don't think we've had, we had 15 webinars leading up to 2019 and to do so many this year, is really a testament to the commitment that we've made to really ramping up the webinar program. So we've covered topics from carabiner and gear maintenance, pest control, plant health care, pruning, uh, all sorts of stuff. And we've got a bunch of really exciting topics coming up on the agenda uh, that you should be excited for and some things we haven't even announced yet. So a lot of events coming up, including new webinars. We'll be at TCIA in early November in Pittsburgh. We've got the micro rigging lab indoor foot locking competition at night, big party. We're giving stuff away. We're selling stuff at crazy cash and carry deals, a ton of opportunities to have fun, learn, maybe take part in a broadcast, uh, play with the demo tree, uh, all sorts of cool stuff. So please stop by. Our booth is right by the food and that's in the beginning of November in Pittsburgh. We've also got webinars coming up, fall plant healthcare with Albert on October 10th and Peter DeVries doing a follow along at home hollow braid splicing on October 24th. So you can watch that live, do it afterwards on YouTube, maybe learn how to do some splicing. So that should be really fun. Uh, tree stuff parties. If you've never been to a tree stuff party, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, it's a recreational climb hosted by a local climber. We send gear for you to try out. You can take your family. Uh, it's really just kind of like a picnic or just a get together. Uh, mixed with kind of like a little gear demo. There's nothing for sale, but uh, totally worth checking out. There's one in Ohio on 922. Uh, that's Zach Lane, I think. Uh, and then in Tennessee on 1019, uh, that's October 19th. And then there's another one in, I think, Oklahoma uh, in November. So that one will be up on the site soon if it isn't already. You can go to our events page on Facebook uh, and sign up for notifications or RSVP is going to any of these events and network with other people that are interested. So definitely check that out. Uh, thanks so much for listening to everything. Thank you so much for being a part of our 15 webinar so far, 2019. We owe a lot to you guys, the audience, uh, for tuning in and participating and making these webinars interactive. So really hope you enjoy Defining Evergreens with Joe tonight. And uh, let's pass it off to Joe. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Nick, I got Kale on the background. I'm Joe Aiken, and I'm going to be hosting the uh, webinar tonight. You guys may have uh, to my left is my four year old son because uh, I failed to get a babysitter in time. So I'm pretty sure he'll be good with us tonight. Um, some of you guys may know me, some of you guys may not. I'm a senior tech manager for ArborJet. Uh, I have a lot of responsibilities, and some of them are research. And what we're going to talk about, something that's dear to my heart, is that um, conifers, evergreens. It's kind of funny that you've been in the business long enough. Everybody that we talk to, everybody calls and talks to you, everything is a pine tree. So understanding uh, the taxonomy and how to identify exactly what you've got is very important when you understanding what type of insects and diseases will go on these plants. Not only are we going to talk about a little bit about that, we're going to talk about some of the latest uh, research that I've been conducting and how to incorporate it into your day-to-day -day plant health care. Evergreens are a, a, a real stickler and a pain in the butt to maintain in the landscape, especially if they're planted in the wrong spot, all the other great things that go along with the wrong tree in the wrong spot. 
So we're going to get started. Um, we'll have a handful of breaks in here to ask questions. So just fire them off and we'll answer the best we can whenever we can. So today was uh, redesigning evergreens. Um, the neatest thing is that uh, not all evergreens are conifers. And it's, it's pretty amazing that after almost 40 years of being in the tree business, I, uh, I'm going to be a lifelong student and continue to try to learn more and more and more. Uh, so if you look at um, all evergreens being, not, being conifers, there's a lot of plants out there that are evergreens that aren't conifers. And vice versa, there's a lot of conifers that aren't evergreens. Uh, take a larch, for example, tamarack, uh, dawn redwood. Those are conifers. Um, but they're not evergreens because they lose their foliage every year. Another one is that uh, we're going to define a conifer today for our talk is a cone bearing plant. Uh, that's probably the majority of the trees that we take care of. So if it has a cone, if it has needles and it has resin ducts, that's some of the hardest plants in the landscape to take care of. So that's going to be kind of the base of what we're going to talk about when we get into what I've been doing, what you guys can do to take care of your customers' trees. Um, what's interesting is that not even all conifers, we talk about conifers that have cones. Uh, there's one tree that in taxonomy is actually based as a conifer with no cones. And believe it or not, it's the ginkgo tree. So there's a little trivia for you. It may be on a quiz, may not, but I just want you guys to be aware that that is considered a conifer, but is not a cone bearing. So when I first got into uh, working with ArborJet, I'm part of the research department, one of the assistant researchers. Working with insects, obviously um, trunk injection kind of got bigger with emerald ash borer. Uh, and if you think about insect, in, injecting a, a specimen with an insecticide, it's pretty easy to see right away if that product worked or not. That's because the the insect's dead or it's not. Now, in a disease, uh, either a fungal pathogen or a bacterium, it's a lot different and it's a lot harder and it takes a lot longer as far as research to develop um, a, a product and a program for diseases than it is an insecticide. So one of the first things that I was worried about here in Michigan and in the Midwest was uh, pitch mass borers. Just about every blue spruce that we have here in the Midwest has that. Uh, now they're even moving on to white pine in Michigan. I have to go look at a test site up in Rose City, Michigan that's loaded with these beautiful mature white pines. At first when he told me there was a problem, I'm thinking could it be Zimmerman um, weevil, or not Zimmerman weevil, but uh, white pine weevils. But it wasn't the top and he sent me pictures and it was pitch mass borer is actually moved over into white pines. Uh, another one is Zimmerman pine moth. Diplodia. Diplodia is a, uh, a very serious disease uh, in uh, Austrian pines that we're going to spend a lot of time talking on because we just finished up a five-year research program and I'm going to be able to share a lot of the uh, the data that came from that to help you guys make a decision on what you guys want to do. Um, again, I got a four-year-old here, so I'm going to try to focus, but if he tugs on my pant leg and if I look down, you guys know what I'm doing. Uh, Cytospora. Cytospora canker is another thing in blue spruce that we haven't spent a lot of time on. Vascular disease, um, I think there's some compounds now that we've been playing around with. If we could uh, organize a, a test site somewhere, I think we have some solutions for even that. Uh, needle cast in Phomopsis. Uh, you don't hear a lot about Phomopsis in uh, landscape. You hear a lot of it in the nursery. Um, and they were really baffled by the fact that it's moving more and more out into the urban forest, into the residential properties on trees that have been planted for a very long time. So that's kind of where I started with Michigan State University on this whole Evergreen trial. Uh, Diplodia was about five year study. It started in 2014. I started with Phomopsis with Michigan State uh, a couple years before that. So you're even talking 2012, 2013, looking at Phomopsis uh, for the Christmas tree growers. So here's some of the, my first test site working with Michigan State on Evergreen. Or is it an evergreen or is it a conifer? It's a conifer. As you can see that this was a test site, there was a bunch of, uh, a random bunch of spruces that were planted here because they had a test site and they were all in some level or not with Phomopsis on it. And 
we wanted to try to see that if stem injection was a viable option. I will tell you guys right now that if I had to stem inject these little trees and crawl up under there in the summer, um, as an applicator, I probably would not do that. It was horrible. It was probably 75, 80 degrees. We had to crawl up underneath these and do stem injections. Uh, so to keep every bug in the world off of us, we had our hoodies on, we had two or three jackets on, bib overalls in 80 degree weather crawling up on these to get the pot of your tree. Some of the research on some of the compounds we put in was very, very well, but the, the technique of getting under there was kind of hard on these smaller trees. Then what we did is with Dr. Dennis Fulbright, that we had to measure, um, because they started on the top and they would work their way down, this phomopsis. So we'd have to measure that after we treated the tree, where did that last um, indicating branch that had the disease how high was it and did it spread back down? So that's all of us out there. Uh, Dr. Dennis Fulbright had this, uh, Dr. Surgeon uh, Asimovich, uh, who's with Cornell now. We were all goofing around underneath these trees and measuring. Well, just when we started getting some great data, um, Dr. Fulbright retired and I was like, oh, bummer. So it took him a while to replace uh, that plant pathologist in Michigan State campus, which I'll introduce in a little bit because she's been very instru instrumental on today's presentation, so I can't give uh, her enough credit. So after uh, Dr. Fulbright retired, um, I was uh, having a good meeting, a sit down, a cup of coffee with Michigan State University's campus arborist, Paul Schwartz. And we've always had a problem with uh, Diplodia on Austrian pines, probably as long as I've been in the tree business. Uh, we've always had a problem with this. It's just been an ongoing thing. So in Michigan State, I was telling them about some of our Phomopsis studies and some of the data we were collecting. Paul wanted to switch over to, on campus, they still have 400 Austrian pines. So if you think about it in an urban setting, they had to send their applicators out to treat these trees at two or three in the morning. So just think if you drew the short straw and you're on the plant healthcare side of uh, grounds maintenance on campus, you had to go in at 2.30 in the morning, spray all these Austrian pines. And thank God that all the students were um, back in their dorms. Uh, you can't do this in the morning, can't do this in the afternoon, just because of the, the public um, perception on the, uh, the fungicide applications would be very negative. So I started telling Paul about, you know, we started these um, evergreen injections. So why don't we try to inject the Austrian pines on campus? And he's like, whatever we can do, instead of having to spray them, let's try it. So that took us to um, figure out where we wanted to treat these. They had a, a series of Austrian pines by these tennis courts on the old side of campus, and they were donated to us to try some of these injections. So this picture right here, if you look closely, um, looks like a tree IV. Uh, the compound that we were putting in there uh, was dyed blue. When we set this IV up, uh, the first in, the first thought process on injecting conifers was you have to do it after the candles elongated, which is the new growth, because you'd have more foliage, more needles. Needles are very similar to leaves on a tree, photosynthesizing and transpiring, and the product would move faster in the tree because of the volumes of the, the, the fungicide were high. So we set it up with IVs, um, a great rate, and then we turned them on. But if you look real closely to this picture, you'll see these lines are clear. That's actually the resin. There's so much pressure, resin pressure in these trees, June, July, August, that they exceeded the pressure in our IVs. Now these IVs are set at 65. I bet you that these, uh, these Austrian pines can generate anywhere over 100 PSI um, in the growing period. So that's actually was remarkable. So that's what puzzled me. Again, if I had to crawl underneath them small trees and inject them in the summer, and if I had, every time I put a system, and even before I worked for ArborJet, I worked for a couple of the cap, I used to use some of the caps. The resin pressure in these would blow the caps right off the tree or they'd fill the caps up. So we had to come up with a plan. And I really couldn't figure out the plan until I sat down and talked to Dr. Deb McCullough. Dr. Deb McCullough is a... Um, a forest entomologist 
Does that bother you? Oh. All right. I, I got yelled at for touching my shirt. It must be touching my mic. I got it. I don't know if I have a bug land on me or something, but I'll stop. Uh, so I talked to Dr. Deb McCullough, and I was telling her the, the heartaches with treating these evergreens. And she, uh, her and Dr. Dave Smitley knew a colleague in Korea that was working with evergreens, but he did it up. He was kind of treating them with a stem injection, but he was doing it in the off season. So we contacted him. I got some of his transcripts and we looked at the weather in the year time of year when he was treating them in Korea. So we translated it, switched it over. We started treating these in uh, Michigan, which we'll get into the study. So in that interim, when we found out what we were going to do, um, Dr. Monique Sakalitas was hired on to, re to fill in uh, Dr. Fulbright's position. So now we have MSU's plant pathologist with us and ArborJet uh, just hired a plant pathologist uh, also. So we're gonna have a great team that we're gonna try to figure out some more, um, some more things that we can do in uh, diseases and trees and shrubs. Again, I need to thank, what's that? Kale, everything good? Uh, no, he's in the cage. He jumped down. So I have my chair next to everybody, and um, he's hanging out down here. He's still here. But so working with um, uh, Monique, uh, MSU, uh, our research department, we're going to set up a couple of new trials uh, for some other conifer kind of diseases that you guys are coming into contact uh, regularly. So first thing that we did after we found out that the best time uh, in the easiest of application was the fall winter for evergreens. So if you look at, um, say, an Austrian pine, first of all, there's three different types of xylem vessels. There's ring porous, diffuse porous, and tracheids. Tracheids are sometimes could be almost uh, 10 to 15 times smaller in diameter than a ring porous tree. So you're talking about the smallest diameter xylem vessels in the plant kingdom, you're talking about a compound that is probably one of the thickest, and you're talking about a plant that produces resin. Uh, resin is uh, is a probably a I'm going to say a prehistoric way for a tree to protect itself, and it actually puts out a compound to protect itself. So a lot of the insects and diseases think about when an insect and disease is active when they pierce the vascular system, the bark, the outer covering, the protective layer of the tree, that protective system inside the tree is designed to pitch out and protect it. So you got resin, thick product, tracheid vessels. So our theory was, can we break one leg in that tripod? So what we did is we looked at everything we could do. We can't change the tree. We can work in the future to try to thin or cram out with a new compound, or we can eliminate resin flow. And that fell right into the professor from Korea to treat on the off season. Uh, the, the, the saying that we say is uh, molasses in the winter. We can actually, November, December, we're shooting for 45 degrees air temp, 45 degrees soil temp. Right around that window, resin flow stops. You can inject resinous conifers like there's no problem whatsoever. So we actually got these trees treated so fast that it was actually amazing. And this is where it all started. And then we started a whole new trial process with Michigan State. So I know we got time for questions. So I want to throw it back to Kale and see if there's any questions yet. Kale, how are we doing? Nice. Uh, I should probably... Uh, Thanks for the comments on my son. He's pretty cool. Um, he's actually kicking me in the leg right now just to make sure I'm still moving. So one of the first things we're going to get into, and which is a big pain in the butt, we're going to start talking about some canker diseases. Um, canker diseases, cytospora canker, and when we get into some of the other uh, studies in the research that's being conducted by Michigan State, you're going to actually see that they fall as part of a big gob of things that are happening at all at once on trees and cankers are part of it. So what some of the damage that a canker does, uh, like I said, one of the most common ones that probably most of us in the industry are familiar with is a cytospora canker. 
blue spruce. Corally blue sap, gets an infection up higher in the canopy. Uh, the canker bleeds and seeps, drops down to the next branch, pierces that, girdles that branch and drips and the whole side of the tree dies off. Uh, it's pretty nasty, but oh, I'm gonna scratch my microphone again. Keep an eye on that. Um, but the, the tissues on the outside of the xylem, um, mainly the phloem and the vascular cambium gets killed and it actually girdles the tree. We can, it, it, now we have a, a fungal pathogen girdling a tree very similar to where an insect girdles the tree. So once that lead is girdled, everything distal from that canker out dies back. So that's why you see all these dead and dying back branches. So if you can follow that back to where it died and look for that canker and peel it back, you can actually use that culture right there to send into your, uh, your local extension agent to figure out exactly what pathogen is causing these cankers. Because there is more than one. Uh, there's a lot of diseases. And believe it or not, there's a lot of diseases that still need to be discovered. Uh, and again, the bark. The bark is a very important part of the tree. It's actually the outside. It's the physical barrier for anything to get in there. And believe it or not, a fungal pathogen cannot penetrate that. There has to be some way for it to get in. And that's why we're starting to believe, and we'll get into it again more later, is that we may have to start turning our pruning techniques to evergreens, conifers, whatever. We may have to switch that to winter like some of our other um, trees. Uh, we've always pruned our elms in the off season in the Midwest and Texas. Now we prune all our oaks in the off season after the first frost. Uh, conifers may be the next. And I'll explain why as we go on. Um, canker pathogens need a point of entry. So if it's not a pruning cut, uh, it could be a, uh, a bark um, a bark scale. It could be a, um, a, a bud scar. It could be a lenticel. It could be something open naturally. But I think most of the penetration and most of this is either uh, abiotic uh, not or made by man, pruning, proper pruning. Uh, a hailstorm could be anything that could fracture a branch enough for that pathogen to enter. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, how's everybody doing out there? Everybody's good? All right, I'm going to take a swig. This is actually coffee. Well, it's not really coffee, but it's not what you think it is. All right, kind of what we just talked about, lenticels, uh, petiole scars, branch stubs. Um all stuff that we have to be aware of uh, when we're dealing with a high pressured area. Some of the damage, chestnut blight, you can see some of the cankers on the screen. Um, a single infection can kill a tree. Depending on where that infection penetrates the tree, if it's in the main bowl, it can kill a tree. It can cause a gall, a, a deformation, um, stem breakage, uh, all kinds of things that could happen because of where that pathogen enters the tree and causes problems. Damage, uh, bull deformation. Uh, you know what? At, at first we're thinking, oh my God, it's going to kill the tree and that's bad. But I was just up at uh, the Michigan Tree Climbing Championship, just hosted their uh, their annual event up in Traverse City. <laughs> and they found a gall on an oak tree, which again is probably formed by a fungal pathogen at a certain point of entry, is probably the size three foot in diameter. 18 inch bull, a three foot diameter gall, 60 feet in the air. That's pretty interesting because a lot of the bulls and the galls that we see are so low. And to see something that had to have disrupted the vascular system, that tree on that bull that high up. Yes? Blankie. Your blankies are in the house. Miss Amy can get them for you. Why don't you go show where they're at? She can go with you. Sorry. Son wants his blankie. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Anywhere there's a point of entry, we could actually have a, a, a problem where there's a, um, a, a, an entry to that fungal pathogen. When to fight back. You know, another good thing is interesting that when the trees are healthy, and we talk more and more about uh, fungal pathogens, we have to understand that the healthier we can keep this tree, uh, the more the tree can ward this off on their own. There's a, a compound called phyto elecans that uh, is produced by the tree to ward off these diseases. But if the tree is stressed out by improper planting, wrong site, drought, um, it can't fight these diseases off themselves. And then what happens? 
we get the call and we have to step in and, and uh, administer some type of first aid uh, to these troops. A couple more pictures. You can actually see the one picture up on the top uh, left, Cytospora, some other cankers. Um, there's the Cytospora a little bit more on the bottom. Uh, pitch canker on pine. There's a lot of problems on our evergreens. And when we get into spruce decline, I'll, we'll, we'll get onto a little bit more. So next I want to talk, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time. Um, again, uh, Kale, if you're still around and you want to, we got a couple of breaks in there. We've been talking for a half hour. What do you think? Should we keep rolling? Okay, we got a question. Uh, hi, Joe. I have one question from Athena. Uh, I think I can get it to come up here. Uh, all right, so she says a lot of hemlocks are dying in her region. She's in region three. Uh, and she heard today it's because of a new fungus new to the area within the last 12 months that looks like woody or woolly Adelgid damage, but there's no Adelgid present. That's, uh, um, the question was, was hemlocks region three a new fungal pathogen? I, have, I haven't heard exactly what it is. I have been getting a lot of reports on it. Uh, in my region right now up in northern Michigan, obviously hemlock woolly adelgid is really spreading in the Midwest. So we have a serious problem here. Uh, I've also had hemlock borer. It was the first time that I've ever seen hemlock borer south of the border. I'm really not sure exactly what uh, fungal pathogen that is. Um, I'm going to have Kale uh, get your information in an off record, um, off record, we're going to, I'll look that up for you. I'll reach out to my research department and some of my contacts to see exactly what's going on, what you got going on. So I'll take care. I'll, we'll help you out with that. Okay, great. Uh, Michael Canaris uh, is from Lexington and he's hearing about a lot of white pine suddenly dying. He's asking about white pine decline and what that is and if that's a real thing. Uh, white pine decline. It's like spruce decline. It's like everything is declining. We don't know. We honestly, there's not a, um, I think when we get to the spruce decline in the second half, it'll, it'll explain to you how difficult it is to determine what the, 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 the agent is that's causing all these problems. And when we get into spruce, I'll, we'll show you that the years it takes to do, uh, DNA sampling on all these uh, cankers and diseases and needles and spores to figure out exactly what it is. So I know there's a lot with white pine. Um, I know there's a lot with all our spruce trees. I know there's a lot with, with all our other stuff like our fir trees. Um, but I'm not sure what exactly is going on with the white pine. Sorry. That's what's amazing about a disease is that um, it's like being a weatherman. Yeah, it's a decline. It's going to rain. Yeah, we know. Um, but we don't know. So great question. Great question. Um, all right. I think that's it. And we could probably keep going. All right, let's go. Um, I'll go for a couple more minutes and I might have to take a quick break so I can grab a blankie, but, um, Rory's being really good. His mom will be home soon. So Diplodia, Diplodia is actually the, uh, the fungal pathogen that really got me, um, interested in spending more time with research. Uh, on this uh, evergreen disease. It's just, it's everywhere. Um, I can drive uh, two miles down the road to take my son to daycare in just about every Austrian pine. Now they're all to the point where the screen is built. Uh, the trees are beautiful. They're 20, 30 years old. They're perfect. And now they're starting to die back. Um, so that's kind of why I pushed um, hard to get Arbajet to adopt and um, after we talked to our head of research, Joe DeCola and uh, Russ Davis, we realized that this is a bigger problem uh, than we thought at first. And they're all on board, so we need to figure out a solution. So we started in 2015 um, looking at this a lot more serious. You know, again, we talk about uh, how does that pathogen get in to the tree? Pruning, storm damage, us people, improper pruning, spreading it, not knowing what it is, spreading to the next tree. 
So we do know that um, there's a lot of casual agents that's moving this. Uh, starting off, it's U.S. wide Austrian pines, heavily planted in the 1900s. Um, if you're in the Midwest, everybody's got them. Uh, see what else? Da severe damage in nurseries, Christmas tree, ornamentals, uh, kills or deforms affected seedling, seedlings. This is a pretty serious problem. And the trees that were planted 30, 40 years ago are just now serving the purpose that they were planted for and we're losing them at an alarming rate. Um, kind of starts off like this. And primarily it's on the Austrian pine is kind of what we can put our finger on, uh, but it affects 20 plus fine pine species. Um, mostly exotic, native two and three needle pines. Um, other conifers, stress, high uh, inoculum, spore load. So they can actually hold the spore uh, long enough for it to blow over onto an Austrian pine. Um, here's some great pictures, great screen. Um, wind blown, damage, hail storms. Uh, here's a great list of uh, a lot of the uh, trees that are susceptible. Oh, but here, sit up here for a second. Good, right there. Do you want Miss Amy to go and get your blankie? Sorry for one second. We're gonna we're gonna eliminate this uh, blankie crisis. Um. Yeah, why don't we take a quick five-minute break? Um, I'll be right back. You good? I'm back. Thanks, Kale. Um, I don't know if we uh, patch anything up. The blankies are missing, but uh, he's next door pulling weeds, hopefully. So we're going to continue. Uh, again, you know, as we look at Austrian pine being the major host for this disease, we're finding it on a lot of other plants. So one of the most important things that when you suspect it, and if it's not on Austrian and you don't know the, the signs and symptoms, your local extension can test for this to, to confirm exactly what we're dealing with. Um, I think what's another thing is uh, some of our spruce, spruce species are having this also. So we get into spruce decline, you'll understand why it's important to understand exactly what uh, disease pathogens are in your area because they can really gang up on a tree. And it's not just one casual agent that's causing it. Um, it could be all four of them, which is pretty amazing. 
first fur species are getting it. So furs, uh, dug fur, and they're even finding it on arborvitaes. So there's a lot of times when you'll see arbs. Uh, and I got some in the front yard. I could have took some pictures that there'll be random spots that are dead. Uh, and if you cut that back, you'll be able to see exactly what's happening on this in the spores. Um, kind of an area where the distribution is really bad. There's some areas in there that are kind of arid and dry. Um, moisture in the spring, wind is a, um, a means of transportation. So you can kind of see the Midwest up into the, up in the Pacific or not Atlantic coast. Um, it's pretty prominent. So it's a pretty big disease and it's a pretty big area that we need to uh, look at and continue to uh, develop solutions. Kind of the pathogen, opportunistic, latent. Latent meaning that uh, an opportunistic, it just kind of sits there waiting for the right opportunity, uh, the right pruning cut, the right storm to come blow by. Um, you may be taking care of uh, your trees, but the neighbor's not. The pathogen can, can form over there and just kind of incubate and wait and wait till your customer tree is either pruned at the wrong time, a windstorm, a hailstorm, then that pathogen during that growth period can enter those trees the next thing you know that customer has it also so we have to keep an eye on that you know i'm not sure how many times you guys as an arborist actually peek over the fence and look at what's going on in the other neighbor's yards but i'd be careful doing that you make sure you're not looking in the wrong yard with the sun pool and our pool and all that but it's very important to be aware of um what's surrounding your customer's property and i'll, I'll tell you a quick story why that's important is i was just up in uh northern michigan uh, walking some properties with um, a, a pretty good arborist up there and we we're looking around and we had some red oaks up there and it, the oak wilk is a concern so we're talking about a disease oak wilk very aggressive and um, the customer wanted us to treat for oak wilk so i'm like all right so we kind of looked down the road drove up and down looked around uh called around and even went on the dnr's website and realized that there's no oak wilk in that county so they were ready to spend eight grand to treat these trees for oak wilt and oak wilt's not even near. So that's why it's really important to do your, uh, a real good research, look around, see exactly what's around. If that's, if, it, if the oak wilt was next door, believe me, we'd be treating those trees. Same thing with some of these diseases. If the disease isn't there, the tree's healthy, there's nothing we could do, just maintain the health plan. So infection and spread, um, transmission, decimation, rain splash, wind driven, um, rain, insects, us. So right now, this is all we really got uh, to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, penetration, directly immature needles, stem tissue, and through stomata. Uh, it can enter through there. Uh, wounds, uh, above ground tissue, sapwood, so it can't go below grade. This pathogen is not a soil borne. It doesn't move through root grafting or anything. It's all above ground. Kind of the disease triangle, you got your, your host, stress, wounding events, and a pathogen. We need to eliminate one of those. Just like when we talked about the triangle for treatment, here's a triangle for a disease triangle. So we have the host. What can we do? Remove the host, plant something different. Is that always uh, the best? In some situations, it may be. You may get the call when that tree is so far gone that no matter what you do to that tree, it's never coming back. When we did the research project on campus at the golf course, we had to rate trees that we knew that could respond for treatment. We had a one to five rating. If it was two and a half or better, it was a treatable tree. If it was two and a half or less, that it was bad enough to the point where it was a removal. So one, you could remove the tree, eliminate the disease altogether. You can eliminate stress. So eliminate stress goes to one of the big things we'll talk about is plant health care. What's the healthiest thing that we could do to these trees to keep the soil and that plant healthy to help resist uh, some of the diseases that we're talking about and the disease pre and present. If you have all three of that, that's quite the, that's quite the storm. If you only have one or two of them, that's a pretty good, uh, that's an op optimistic thing where you can take care of these trees very well. It's environment, we talked about rain, high humidity, cool to moderate. Low rain when shoots emerge equals less disease. There's another plant that we take care of and been taking care of for years. Um, you guys may be taking care of it on an annual basis is uh, apple scab. Rust, leaf diseases on deciduous trees. Same thing, if we have a wet spring 
Uh, a lot of you guys may have seen uh, real bad symptoms on sycamores this year because of all the excessive rain we had this spring. Hot stress and host, so uh, hot stress, uh, drought, uh, there's all kinds of things, hail, snow, pruning. All these things have to be monitored and avoided if you go back to this disease triangle to eliminate stress on that plant. Symptoms, new shoot, resin droplets um, on the needles emerging. You, you get in there, and most of us that do plant health care, you guys all have um, hand lenses. So you can get up in there and take a good close look. Uh, wilted, stunting, crooked new shoots. Diseases act slow. An insect stunts growth fast. So if you have a candle elongating, it's just slowing down, it's a good chance that it is a disease. Now, if it dies and shuts off right away, it's probably an insect. So you can look at that. You know, we see in tip dieback, we got to get in there. You might have to cut this shoot open. You might have to get really in there and see if you're seeing spores. Um, and kills current year. So well, these are all things that we need to look at. Now we got to get in there. Now with the, somewhere in there, we got a call. There's an Austrian pine. It does not look good. Now we're digging into it. Symptomatic new shoots talked about that and damages often first evident in lower crowns. Here's a couple of branches. Mid to late summer. Next thing you know, they're flagging. We're looking, oh my God, this tree looked great all year. What's going on? So now we get a little bit closer. Next thing you know, as the year goes by, it's getting a little bit worse. Now you're getting more calls, more calls after a storm event. So now you got to get in there. Now we have to start doing some inspecting, some, just some deep digging in there. Um, and this is some of the stuff that you're going to see if you got your hand lens, if it was Diplodia. You can kind of look at the, um, the fruiting bodies on the twigs, needles, cones. And one of the neatest things that I do, and the easiest way to show a customer when you're working with uh, Austrians at Diplodia, is pick up a couple of the cones and show them to the customers. If you got your hand lens on there, these little black fruiting bodies are very evident. And when we get into talking about the disease with the injectables that I did on campus, we actually eliminated the spores even on the cones. It takes two to three years to develop a cone. So it's not an over year, like a, like a helicopter on a maple where it comes out every year and they fly. It takes two to three years to develop a cone. So when you get a systemic in a tree that, that um, translocates to that part, it actually treats that fruit also with the fungistat. It's actually pretty amazing. There's the asexual spore that's floating around, uh, released from asexual fruiting bodies and spreads around in a wet growing season, spring. Again, leaf litter, picking up the cones, looking for the, uh, the spores. That's a perfect example to dig deep out in there and pull a couple of them out. I guess that if we would do a good cleaning up there and get rid of a lot of that, you could eliminate out about a lot of the pressure. Um, but I'm not sure. I've never tried to good clean up underneath an Austrian pine before, unless it was elevated. The disease cycle, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, overwinning, uh, cone, bark, scale, debris. Uh, spring infections blows around, hits the tree, uh, dispersed throughout the year. Boom, right back into the vicious circle. Another great close-up, hand lens, small black fruiting bodies. It's a great picture. I kind of like it. Really see it. You can really see them when you pick that, uh, that cone up. Management and uh, prevention. Right now, um, a lot of it is preventative, just like a lot of our things. Uh, good cleanup. Avoid placing container growth ceilings, blah, blah, blah. Remove cone-bearing trees. So we kind of talked about prevention. If you can't do some of this, this is where I kind of stepped in and we have to figure out a solution as far as a treatment protocol for this. That's what we started on campus. So again, these are some of the trees. Uh, we, that was a duplicate uh, management. So we got into the chemical. Right now, one of the most um, widely used treatments, and there's three ways to treat these trees. Boiler applied, um, soil applied, or stem injected. So on our first go around with our research project for Diplodia, we used all three in various rates and, and uh, chemicals. So we had to figure out how to get the product in the plant. So we looked at a bunch of things and um, 
some of you guys may have seen this. This is probably one of the only charts I'll show today because it's kind of tough to see. Is that um, 2015 when we elevated, evaluated the trees? Remember, we talked about two of five to one excellent. They were good enough and healthy enough to be part of the trial. Everything that was rated two, five, or less were probably removals. So we have a series of compounds that we used uh, fully applied. Soil applied, trunk inject. So the following year, our very first year after our first treatment, you can kind of see that there's a little bit better in the controls. Uh, the controls probably because of, it wasn't a wet spring, there wasn't a lot of heavy pressure. Two years later, you can actually see after treatment in a lot of the compounds that we use that these trees were already getting better. By the third year, last year, walking on the golf course, we could stand there. Now, this is one application three years later. We could actually stand back and look at the trees that we treated uh, from the trees that we didn't, and they looked between night and day how beautiful they looked. So now we have uh, a solution in compounds that we can actually interject with these trees and turn them around. Uh, one treatment uh, every other two to three years, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is being published, uh, Journal of Arboriculture, so we'll be able to publish the data uh, and what we used very soon. I do know that uh, propiconazole does have uh, Diplodia on the label. If you guys want to try injecting, you can contact me. I can kind of coach you through it. Uh, it's very, very effective on this specific host and disease. I left a slide in here because one of the neatest things that we did is that um, in this study, and it's in part of the paper that's being published, well, actually some of that stuff, they, uh, because it was such a big article, they took some of the stuff out, is that I was curious as to one of the compounds that was very effective was uh, a phosphite. So we used a phosphite. I'm like, all right, the trees responded well. But then I did soil samples. And when I did soil samples on all the trees that were in the study, Phosphites in the soil were off the chart available. So that made me believe why. So talking to our research department, what they did is then we took soil samples and then I did tissue samples. And it was amazing to see the difference between what's available and what the tree could get. So we looked into pH. Uh, the pH was probably right where it should be with this plant but the pH was at a point where it couldn't release some of the compounds in the soil for this tree to absorb, to treat itself. Um, kind of like a, we need to create like a, like a placebo or an elicitor to, for to trick this tree into needing these compounds. So that's another direction research is gonna go, is try to get these trees to respond to disease uh, through soil, um, through soil health. That was pretty interesting. So we looked into all that. So it's pretty amazing to see the difference between soil, tree, disease, and what's available in the plant. Pretty cool stuff. This is kind of the beginning of it. Uh, obviously, uh, Joe DeCola is a head research, myself, Marianne, Dr. Don Grossman, and Surgeon. So this will be out for you guys to read very soon. So it'll kind of it'll kind of tie a lot of dots together on what you guys can do for needle disease, especially diplodia. Gail, how are we doing? Let's shoot for some questions um, and I'll take a swig. All right, perfect. Um, our first question is from, hold on, is from Adan Ayala. He's asking uh, how much more effective uh, our treat our trunk injections for diplodia than fungicidal sprays um, assuming that trunk injections are are going to offer you a longer residual control I personally because of my I've been in the tree business almost for almost 40 years and I've done trunk injections for diplodia if it's timed right and you can get and the interesting thing about fully applied is it always took more longer if a customer is willing to invest into a five, six, seven year program with three to five sprays to get them under control, because you have to get that needle under control and you know, all the old uh, fruiting bodies have to uh, fall off and the tree has to, it, you can. I'm amazed that uh, getting propiconazole in a tree through a trunk injection 
during the right time of the year where it makes it easy to do, I think the trunk injection is by far more effective, more cost beneficial, uh, and more effective because I've seen it and I'm pretty amazed with it. So I would go trunk injection. If you have the injection techniques or the, the, the tools, go trunk injection. You can get it under control, but it takes a lot longer to pull it, if that makes sense. Okay, and then Athena is asking about needle cast. Um, are trunk injections... What was that? No, I just... That's great. I already I know where she's going. Okay. But, she's asking about trunk injections versus spray applications there. Uh, very similar to the uh, Diplodia. It has been tested. It's very, very, very effective through trunk injection. It's just not on the label. Okay. How's that? Uh, so it is working where the research is being done. We're showing positive results with needle cast with trunk injection. Uh, we probably need a season or two more to have enough data to submit for label uh, change. Okay. Uh, and then Adon asked another question here. Um, I know we touched on Diplodia and the Arborvitae. Um, he's asking, is it is it the same concern for Arborvitae in the southeast? Arborvitae? Ar however. I, I, <laughs> Kale, Kale, you're killing me. So Arborvitae. So Arborvitae's... Um, I think it, the, the disease acts the, acts the same. So how far south is that pathogen? I'm not sure. This is a great question. If you, I'm not sure exactly where he's at um, or where you're at. If it's farther south than where that line is, where it's known, it could be another fungal pathogen. That's where it'd be very important to contact your extension agent to see exactly what is down there. Um, a lot of them react the same, and a lot of them can be controlled the same. But understanding exactly what it is first would be very beneficial. Because that way you can select the product that's on the market that's labeled for it, if that makes sense. It does. And then, let's see, I've got... Every time we start asking questions, um, more people start sending in more and more as we go. So uh, how oh, effective what, 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 is what, what, biochar what? with soil health for preventing these diseases that you're talking about? There's a lot of great research being done right now. One of the compounds that we used uh, in the Diplodia study was a, a, a Arbor Char product. It was a Char product. And it was actually mixed with some, some other uh, products that are not, uh, we can't talk yet because it's, uh, it's propital, that we see an amazing result. So there is a lot with Char, and there's a lot of people working on it right now. I think that um, in the future, uh, with soil health, with the char, with some other uh, components and compounds with that, I think we're going to have an amazing product in the next year or two. Uh, I would uh, I'd keep your eye open for that. That's going to be pretty neat. Yes, it does work. Okay. And then our last one for now, uh, Kyle Karavik is asking if you've tried using any plant growth regulators to combat diplodia. diplodia yes. you're saying it. Uh, yes, there is um, empirical evidence to show that plant growth regulators um, with soil moisture managers uh, applied to evergreens going into winter uh, to assist with desiccation. And uh, we all know that plant growth regulators, because on evergreens you can't overregulate, uh, does a lot of great stuff uh, to stimulate root development. In a lot of urban soils, evergreens, there's a lot of problem with root development. So there is a lot of great, great research looking at this. Again, um, it's going around the industry, and there's guys probably trying it, um, but it's very hard to recommend it if that's not what it's labeled for. But because someone tried it, because we stumbled upon it, we are trying to get to move forward on that uh, as a research product so we can submit that to the the EPA and say, yes, and can we use it for this too? Good question. Um, you know what? It's a beautiful night. Let's just keep rolling. We're already an hour into it. We probably got a half hour, 20 minutes left. Uh, and we'll do some more questions. If everybody says go, let's go. Uh, I got about 20 more slides. Um, and then we can kind of get into some more questions. So hopefully the slides um the next group that we're going to talk about is another thing that's kind of getting i think i smacked my mic it's kind of getting dear to my heart is because 
all the data that we learned through the Diplodia study, the five-year study that we did with Michigan State, um, we're now working with uh, Arborjet, um, our plant pathologist ploy, and we're going to work with uh, uh, Monique with Michigan State, and we're going to figure out what's going on with these spruces. Uh, spruce decline, we talked about, someone said something earlier about pine decline. Yeah, they're declining. There's a lot of casual agents. We just can't figure out which one is causing it because they're all opportunistic. And it, basically all we have right now is comes down to try to keep these plants as healthy as possible to hold them off long enough so we can come up with a solution. So I just signed a contract with a homeowners association nearby that have over 100 blue spruces and they're all dying. They can't afford to take them down. They're in situations and they're all dying from spruce decline. We can see just about everything can possibly on there. But one of those diseases or one of those agents is what's causing it to go over the edge and causing these to decline. So looking at these pictures, if you can kind of see the one in the front is what a blue spruce should look like. This is what they're looking like in the Midwest. We need to figure out you're getting great spring growth, new candle immersion. But the second year, third year needles back, are it's defoliating. Those evergreens need those needles for photosynthesis. Again, that needle is no different than a leaf on a deciduous tree. So if it continues to lose that much foliage that it can't photosynthesize and it can't produce the starches and sugars, it needs to leaf out for the next year. How many years in a row can a tree put up with that before it starts to decline and die? So we need to figure out, again, like Austrian pines, I think there's probably more spruce trees planted in the landscape than there are deciduous trees. So we need to figure this out. We need to figure it out fast. So the current, first reported early 2000s. So it's been around for a while. Um, I was walking through campus on an event uh, and I was rushing from one side of the campus to the other. And it's even affected Norway spruce. So many guys, you may have Norway spruce that are getting thin. Um, one of the tests that we're gonna do is we're gonna be shooting a light, uh, a photo ray, not a photo ray, but a photo, uh, a light through it to capture density of the foliage to figure out how bad they are and if what we're doing is keep filling these trees out. So it's widespread death, uh, started in the nurseries and now it's moving back out just like Phomopsis, now it's out into the, uh, to the landscape. Uh, some of the tree decline, um, site changes, changes in soil, moisture, aeration, chemistry. Um, another bad thing is that everybody loves these spruces raised up off the ground. Uh, one of the harshest things you can do is raise a spruce that high where you got sunlight beating down on those uh, roots. We all know that conifers, especially blue spruce, has a very shallow root zone. So by elevating those, you don't shade that no more. You're actually getting more heat uh, on those roots, which causes more root stress. So be careful on elevating them too high. Uh, physical chemical inputs. Um, so obviously your uh, abiotic stresses, biotic stresses, uh, microbial, microbiology, uh, dying off because of certain things that we're doing to it. Secondary changes in feedback, increased uh, defoliation. Again, the needles fall off, it can't photosynthesize. So it's kind of this snowball effect that keeps happening on what we're doing to these. So we need to figure out exactly what it is. So needle dot, drop, branch death. Um, a lot of times you see, you, we first think it's needle cast. It goes back to the question, does it work for needle cast? At first, my answer is, yeah, probably. But it's not just needle cast, so there's other things going on. So we dug deeper and deeper into these, these evergreens. So again, loss of needles. Uh, current year needles begin to die. Needle loss in the lateral branches continue to die back. Branch death starts to, from the base upward. So we got in a little bit deeper on these. So now these spruces, again, we talked about cytospora, very common on spruce trees. You dig in there, there's the canker. So now we have needle cast, Cytospora. There's two of them on the exact same tree. So you dig in a little bit deeper. Now you got uh, the needle cast as rhizosphere or stigmenia. Now you have these pathogens on the needle. So needle cast, cytospora. Dig in a little bit deeper. Phomopsis. Now we're finding Phomopsis, the fourth thing on this tree, or the third. So now we have three casual agents all on the exact same tree. Which one do you treat for? That's the problem. Next thing you know, now we have four pathogens. Uh, found. But in 2011, um, we started digging into it deeper. Then we found out that on these trees, there was right exactly uh, on some of these branches, we're finding a different type of canker. So it wasn't uh, Cytospora, it was something different. 
So they actually started culturing them. At first, they thought it was Phomopsis and it causing a canker to cause that, that, that shepherd's hook. But they dug into it deeper. And when I throw you the next slide, you kind of see how hard it is to determine exactly what this is. It has to be figured out through DNA testing. Um, there's a new disease being identified on these. The fourth casual agent is diaporte. Some of you guys may have heard of it. Some of you guys may have had not. But every tree, uh, which is a form of Phomopsis, goes back to the later name. Every one of these trees had all four of these casual agents on it. So to figure this out, um, and you can't really see it because the, the way the slide was prepared, I tried to get it to scroll around. So this is the DNA testing for this. And it probably goes down two or three slides. In the trees that had the worst effect on them, all were hit with this diaporte fungal pathogenomic. So now we have the fourth casual agent. Is it just because of that causes spruce decline? We're not sure. Is it a combination of all four plus abiotic disorders? We're not sure. This is what we're going to find out. So we're digging into it. So we started digging around, and these are uh, these are the two diaporte strains. So everywhere that these trees were dying, where Michigan State did cultures and samples, they found it in all the worst trees. So now we're getting somewhere that this is part of reason why we have spruce decline. And this has been going on for years, so you can kind of see how long it takes to find out what's actually going on to these trees. So host susceptibility, Colorado blue spruce. I was talking to an arborist up northern Michigan. He goes, man, he was just out in Colorado and all the blue spruce looked great. So what does that tell you? Is that we took a native species that are out there, and we brought it here to the Midwest, and we planted them, and we're wondering, oh, my God, why are they struggling? Well, they're not in the right spot not where they're supposed to be. So Norway, um, white spruce, black spruce, Serbian, um, those all get it and they're all dying. So we have to figure out why we need to figure out fast. Best practice right now, again, use alternative species. So if you're gonna cut one down, try something different. Uh, site, well-drained, good airflow. We know that this fungal pathogen has to need a wet, moist spring. Uh, well-spaced, airflow. We say that, but most of the trees that we come in contact were actually built for a screen and they're all butted up to each other. And next thing you know, when they get to a point where no wind can blow through there, they start to decline and die. What is that? I don't know what the, the answer for that one is. I think that is an industry we're gonna have to figure out. Do we stagger them? How do we do it? Do we get more creative? Do we mix up the type from spruce, pine to arbs or cedars? We're gonna have to make more of a biodiverse burn. Um, chemical. Uh, nursery age, younger trees, cultural, pruning out disease branches may slow it. Um, but if it's in the vascular system, uh, which we're not sure, you know, cytosper can move. Um, pruning out those dead branches, will it help? I have not seen too many uh, spruce trees uh, respond positively to pruning out the, um, the disease branches. Mature landscape trees, current control measures are very unsatisfactory. Because we're spraying and we're thinking that it's needle cast, we're spraying probably at Cleary's or something for needle cast, and we're not getting the control that we need. And I think it's because the, the, the four agents that are on there aren't being controlled in a combination of all four of those, that one compound can't do it. So we need a lot of work to do. Um, we need to find out exactly where we need to go with this, in what direction, uh, part of my new study is going to be, uh, again, light infiltration through. Uh, we talked about some of the char products and some of the phosphite products. We're going to try that on. We're going to try a winter injection. Again, trunk injection for disease and resinous conifers would be 45 degree soil temp, 45 degree air temp. Um, Diplodia is on the label, and we're hoping that some of these other uh, fungal pathogens can get on the label in the future. We should have some data in the spring to determine... Um, is this, is this a, the right direction? Um, a lot of these trees, I'm going to air spade. I'm going to fracture the soil. Um, we're going to try to remediate the soil on some of them and just do soil health. Uh, some of them are going to do soil health plus the char plus the fights. Some of them we're just going to inject. Uh, we need to find a way that you guys can preserve these spruce trees in the, in the landscape. So I only have, uh, that's just about it. We kind of went through it pretty quick. Um, again, I can't thank Michigan State enough, uh, Dr. Monique Sakalitis, Dr. Deb McCullough, for sharing. You know, a lot of these slides were actually from their 
their lectures that the students are getting in, in on campus. So it was pretty awesome. They shared this with me. Um, here's a little bit about me, why we kind of wrap up with some questions. So um, I'll turn it over to Kale. We kind of push through it so we can kind of uh, get off to our night tonight. Um, Kale, how are we doing on questions? All right, I've got a question here from uh, Jason Dudek uh, asking cool. about how poor planting affects a tree's chances of getting fungus. Um, and then also if there's if there's been anything uh, that, um, that any problems that anyone's seen with planting trees with a burlap uh, bag around the bulb. Okay, uh, both quiz questions. Now planting, um, now if you think about a tree in nature, uh, right perfect depth, the good flare, the roots are right where they want to. When we start planting trees in the landscape, a lot of times it could be an inch or two, um, too low or too high. I wish I had some pictures. Um, the same complex where I'm gonna be doing the uh, spruce, uh, blue spruce study is that every one of the maple trees are planted about a foot too high. And every one of them been planted since the early 80s, and they're only all about six inches in diameter. So if the roots can't get established because of the poor planting practices, then that tree's never going to flourish. And if the tree can't flourish, it can't protect itself. So planting is probably the first and most important part of establishment of getting a tree to be healthy and have a healthy life is actually planting it properly. Now, there's a lot of naysaying, and there's a lot of... Uh, I don't, there's a lot of debate back and forth about the burlap sack and everything. Um, I have taken trees down that they did not cut the burlap or the metal cage back that girdled the branches that went through it. Now you got to think that um, you got this big, nice, heavy galvanized basket. Now as the fibrous roots start to grow through that and become into more structural, um, they're not going to break that cage and eventually it's no different than planting them in a bucket where they start to girdle. That wire cage will girdle it. So I am a big proponent of getting it planted, packed in tight, cutting the basket down as far as you can. Now the burlap. If it's true burlap and it's below grade, it will rot. But a lot of the new uh, sisal that is being used to drum lace the tops of these have more of a... Um, inorganic compound more of a plastic to them i went to a property a couple years ago and he had two uh, pear trees planted on either side of his driveway one was doing great and one wasn't i just couldn't figure it out soil tests were the same soil compaction was the same so i started digging back the mulch the tree that was not going well they never cut the burlap off it or the sisal around the bale of the tree the bowl of the tree that tree is being girdled from day one uh, two years later, we cut that off. We peeled back as much as we could. Um, that tree is doing a lot better now. So if you can get it off, get it off. If you can cut the, bird, the cage back as much as you can, I recommend doing it. It will in the long run. might not be in our lifetime, your lifetime, but it may be in the next generation's lifetime that it will be a benefit to the tree. Take it off. I lost your sound. Oh, sorry. There you are. Uh, <laughs> I've got a question here, um, but you were talking a little bit about the xylem of coniferous trees. Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit about how uh, that xylem is different and the different different types of xylem that there are? Yeah, so there's three basic types of xylem. Now, we understand a xylem is for uptake movement, water, and soluble uh, minerals from the soil. So you have a ring porous tree. A ring porous tree, elm, oak you can kind of relate that to a big old McDonald's straw. It's huge, a lot of pop, gets you up to the fountain, you drink more, you eat more. Um, diffuse porous. Now, if you looked at annual growth rings on a ring porous tree, you can actually really see spring wood. So the large diameter vessels are put off in the spring. So when the tree wakes up and starts to grow, it grows real fast in the spring, it puts out spring wood and that's the large diameter vessels. As the year goes by, they get smaller, smaller, and smaller. Then the tree goes dormant, and then it stops. Next year, spring vessels. Slower, smaller, smaller, smaller. Annual growth ring stops. Those large diameter vessels on a ring porous tree, you can put a ton of product in those large diameter. It doesn't really matter the thickness of the product, 
or what you're putting in there or the volume, that tree takes it. Now you step down into some of the maples, the ashes, you get into a diffused porous tree. Those early spring vessels are half the size of a, a ring porous tree. So now you have res restricted, that's more like a bar straw. So it's really, really thin. Now you have to get the same amount of compound through a smaller diameter pipette. That affects your flow throughout the tree. Now we step into trachids. Trachids are even five times smaller than that. And ring porous and diffuse porous are like cones stacked on top of each other with sieve tube cells. On a trachids being that small, now they're overlapped. So not only they're five or six times, 10 times smaller, now they're overlapped. You have to get a compound to be able to go through that tiny micro pore. So it comes down to molecular size, the size of the compound that you're designing. Can you get it in there? Can you get it small enough to flow through that trachids? And it's got to go through there. There's actually ports between overlapping cells, so the product has to zigzag its way up. That's why it's very difficult to inject a, um, a conifer. Now you throw resin ducts. So for every overlapping xylem cell right alongside there, now you have resin ducts. So when you try to do a stem injection in a, a, a resinous tracheid vessel tree, every time you drill past that, you open up resin ducts. So if you inject the tree at the wrong time, especially in July like I did, the resin pressure exceeds anything that you can put in there, and it's the tree's re defense response because it's a prehistoric tree to seal off that site so the insects or disease can't get in it. So I kind of hope that, that that helped out. Yeah, I think that did. Um, and here's another one from Michael Canaris. Is it okay to use short stop and neutral root with each other, or do they just work against each other? Um, both great products, and I, I believe that uh, I don't mix them together, but they can be applied at the same time. Yes. Okay. Our next one. Um, is Adon asking about any interior pruning or thinning? I know you touched on it a little bit, um, but when you have something that might be susceptible to spruce decline, is it does it help or is it just an unnecessary added stressor to go in and to prune out um, that that interior dead stuff? I think um, that's a that's a really a tough question. Aesthetically, you want to go in there and do it. You really do um, because you're thinking that you need to. The bad thing is, is that the more that you take, even those, those dead scaffolding branches are still holding up the fronds that are alive. So what happens with snow load? Have you guys ever seen someone? I don't know if you can hear it, but a big hot rod just went down the street. But it, I don't know if, if you ever seen a blue spruce that just kind of sagged down at the bottom. It's like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Then they pruned all the interior dead branches off, and then from right for that, they just kind of wilted. So there's nothing holding that up. Um, if there's something that's sticking out of sight, I would say prune it out aesthetically. But if you can leave those as long as you can to hold those other ones out, um, I say it's got to be a fine balance of pruning that out. I think pull the aesthetic, aesthetic ones. Um, if you're going to do some of the, the infected ones, be very careful on how many you take out and just, and just slowly work that through. Sorry, I was muted again. Um, what um, what do these trees have that they can use? Like, what are their defense mechanisms? Um, and is there anything that we can kind of do to help out their defense mechanisms to get them to fight these diseases? Uh, great question. I know that there's a lot of research on elicitors in trees. Um, obviously, you guys all heard of placebo that... Um, in medicine that they've showed that if you give patients a sugar pill and they tell them it's a wonder drug, they miraculously their body can heal themselves. Um, I think we, the industry feels that trees can do it too. So the question that was asked is not far off the future. We think that, uh, and we talked about the soil sample and the tissue sample um, between the diplodia and Austrian pines. Somewhere in there is the elicitor to tell the tree that it needs to absorb what's in the soil that's there to protect itself. That's, um, we're looking at it. We're really trying to find out because we can't rely on harsh pesticides forever. Um, 
Arbor Jet's a great company. We're always trying to look for the next, um, I don't want to say safer or softer, uh, the, the next responsible product for the industry that we can use and feel confident in, in just keep the environment healthy. So we're really trying to do that. And if we could do it by tricking a tree to release compounds because it thinks it's under attack, um, I think it's a pretty amazing thing. And we're not that far off. Uh, great question. Um, we've got Nick Benson here asking if research has shown a difference between diluted and undiluted injections in conifers. Uh, we have. We have injected diluted with the IV. And we haven't directed straight. And I will honestly tell you that the diluted product took five times as long to get in. The undiluted straight product went in like butter and both trees look great. So I know when deciduous trees, I know that's probably not the case. That um, That's why on some of your oaks and elms, we recommend that you dilute it. Uh, it translocates a little bit better in the tree. But I think what's interesting is that we look at, you know, most of our injections are done on deciduous trees. Exponential growth. Every inch of the canopy, the canopy just goes 10 times bigger. So we have to change the volume for a deciduous tree to, to have enough compound to treat the whole canopy. Look at a conifer. What's, the, what's different about a conifer? It's just the opposite. So you got this base. We go by DBH. You hit the first frond. And what happens? It gets smaller to the top. So one, we're realizing that it doesn't have to be diluted as much, if any. And two, we don't have to use as much product. Uh, and we don't have to use as much product because the canopy gets smaller. And we don't have needle drop. So the product gets to the terminal bud, treats that new candle, goes to the next terminal bud, treats that candle. So we don't know how long, what the possibility of the future is on conifer injections, how long uh, a compound will last in them. So it's been pretty amazing. Okay. Um, great answer. Do gymnosperms compartmentalize any differently than angiosperms? I don't know if there's any differences. I know compartmentalization on both... Uh, Evergreens, conifers, and deciduous trees, angiosperms, gymnosperms, I think they're about the same. I have never heard of anything being different, but I've never been asked that question. I think it's brilliant. Now I'm going to have to write that one down and figure it out. Because um, if you look at you know, 40 years of pruning spruce pine trees, they compartmental over, compartmentalize over uh, the same way of bud scars. I know when we prune off a branch, we do a little bit closer. There's not a branch bark collar, but um, those wounds do heal over. So there is compartmentalization, but I'm not sure um, if there's any difference as far as the four walls or not. Neat question. I'm going to look that one up. Okay. Um, one more, I think, unless somebody else pops one up here uh, while you're answering this one, but I know you talked a little bit about um, diseases uh, and insects and funguses being spread around, how those diseases get spread, uh, what different ways do they have to get into the actual tree themselves? Uh, can you talk yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah, we can cover it. Uh, we have a hard time understanding it. I, I, think, I think it's speculation. Um, I honestly think that most trees... Um, I think uh, conifers are going to go to a fall tree, a fall pruning, um, give it that time to harden off. Um, this is a lot of stuff that we need to look at because in the past, we thought we could prune them at any time of the year. It was no big deal. Um, you get a little bit of pitch. The pitch is actually there for a reason. It's got some antiseptic solution to it. It was all good. But now we're realizing that um, by pruning that during a disease, part of the disease cycle, you could be actually opening the vascular system up for a lot of problems. Um, we, I think we need to study it more. I think we understand, need to understand our effects on handling uh, Mother Nature and trees in general. Uh, there's a few broad uh, recommendations. Uh, another one that I heard someone recently tell me is that they were treating, um, what were they treating? And old school thought was you always sterilize your drill bit in between injections or between trees. 
uh, not between tr not between injections on the same tree, but if you switch to another tree, you're supposed to sterilize drill bit. Well, even your handsaw, people are always, oh, you got to sterilize your handsaw. Well, guys got away from a lot of guys sterilizing the handsaw and the equipment and the loppers. But I just heard of a story recently where a guy spread a disease and trying to think what it was from tree to tree to tree. So he had trees that were showing symptom, it was symptomatic to one disease, and he treated a couple of trees past that in all three trees. The only thing that happened to those trees is that he drove them. So I still think we need to be careful of when we prune, when not to prune. Um, I think that's about all I got on that. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think we need to build on it with research. Okay. Uh, one more here from Benjamin Joseph Garrison Moore. Um, cool. He is asking what you would suggest to a client who's wanting to replace their green screen with the same conifer that was just removed because it was sick. Uh, so uh, like what you would uh, recommend to them to, to put in, and I would also say, uh, how do you tell them that they're wrong? What, what would you use the, to, oh, to do that? That's the, old, that's the old proverbial is the customer right. You know, you, they all have a life expectancy and so does your customer. You have to do, you know, and I, I can see the customer's point of view. Now, if you had this beautiful, say it's an arb, arb hedge, they're all arbs. What are you going to, what, what else can you put in there? First of all, it's going to be the different size and shape because they haven't been there for 20 years. But I can't see put anything in there. You really got to find out exactly what's going on with that tree. Is it biotic? Is it bi abiotic? If it's abiotic, it's a drain. It's something um, on that berm. Who knows what the contractor put in there? You really got to find out why that one tree died. If it's something that you can remediate and fix, put it back in there. Um, but with the guarantee to know that the customer has to know that this pathogen is nearby. We could be doing this every year. We could be replacing one or two of them. Um, if you want the aesthetic appearance of having all the same shrub, you need to realize that we could continue to have this problem every year. Um, but dig deep, figure out exactly why that died and see if, first of all, see if there's a solution to your problem. If there's not, then you got to let them know that I'll put one in here every year if it makes you happy, but it's going to die every year. Uh, the customer is going to have to make the choice and you got to put that in writing. I've seen that way too many times. Well, I want a blue spruce there again. A young blue spruce will probably live 30 years. And if it's an older customer, they're not going to see it die. I don't want to be morbid, but if that's what they want, put it there and do your best to control it. Um, there's not every site where we can mix up the plantscape because um, of a disease. So it's a slippery one, but you just got to let them know that uh, in, they have to really have a realistic expectation with you as the arborist on staff that this is going to happen every year. Or if there's something I could do, I'll do the best I can to prevent it. Okay, great. I think that is it. Um, if you want to wrap it up or have any closing thoughts. Um... Yeah, I, um, you know, thanks to Tree Stuff for putting these on. I think they're pretty amazing. I think it gives everybody an opportunity to reach out. Um, I'm a pretty accessible guy. So if you guys ever need anything, you guys can get hold of uh, Tree Stuff. They got my number. Um, I'll help you out any way I can. Uh, we got nine other. Uh, tech managers throughout the country that are arborists within the region. Um, we're here to help you guys out. So don't be afraid to reach out to us. We have a great research department. So if there's something that you're asking that I don't know, uh, I got no problem sending it out. You guys can send me an email. I'll forward on the research. Um, our connections throughout the, all the extension throughout the country and not even just uh, the U.S., uh, Canada also. So we're here to help. Uh, you know, again, thanks, Tree Scott stuff. I, I I enjoy getting on the webinars when I'm not hosting or, or giving one. Uh, there's a lot of great information. This industry is changing. Um, and I'll thank ArborJet because ArborJet knows that it's changing. And we're trying to find the next solution, which is actually pretty exciting. And that's kind of why I'm, I'm still as excited about being an arborist now as I was 40 years ago. So, um, and thank you guys for uh, spending part of your Thursday night to listen to hopefully something that will help you guys in the future with some of your uh, conifer problems. Yeah, so with that said, I will, um, I'll say thank you guys for tuning in. I'm gonna throw it back to Nick to wrap up. And uh, again, if you guys need me, reach out. Back to you guys. 
Okay, wow, Defining Evergreens with Joe Aiken. Thank you again to Joe and the ArborJet team in general for being so willing to come on to these webinars and give of your guys' this time and uh, do these because without our presenters, we don't really have a webinar series. Uh, the post for the test uh, should be posted now. You should be able to see it in this chat or uh, in the main Facebook page in a separate post. So click on that. You need a 16 out of 20 to pass. We will send the results in in a week or two. We'll close the test down. And then it might take the ISA two, three months sometimes to get you your CEUs. But please rest assured, you don't need to send us a ton of emails. We will uh, make sure that everyone that attends our webinars and gets a passing score gets their CEUs uh, at the end of the day. So uh, yeah, rest assured, we've got that. Um, 15 webinars, we couldn't have done it without our crew. Uh, Jake Miller, Carson, and Kale Royer really putting in all the work to make these things happen, uh, tackling huge technical problems, building up good solid processes. So a uh, big thanks to those guys for making this so possible. Um, we've got like a new remote webinar kit, which is really cool. Kale's been working on that, uh, putting it together. Everything ships now in a big Pelican case with custom cut foam and an instruction manual. And uh, Joe's actually one of the first people to use uh, the fully customized remote kit. So hopefully it went really well, right? Um, and nobody had any audio problems. I thought it was good. Uh, so yeah, but this kit is enabling us to do more stuff and do more webinars in different places faster and with more hosts. So, you know, if you want to do a webinar, you know someone that you think would make a great webinar host, let us know sooner than later. We're booked out six, maybe nine months in advance right now uh, with a ton of different stuff coming. And uh, we would love to have more hosts. So uh, thank you so much for participating. Please send us any feedback or interest that you have at media at treestuff.com. And you know, next time, bring a friend. All right, thanks so much, bye. You guys ready? Yep.
just from when I started till now, the advancements in this industry are huge. It's crazy. The most technological advanced thing we have going for us right now, I think, is the, the remote control tree removal machines, like the Altec Knuckle Boom. I mean, we can take a tree that would have been you know, a 40 inch ash removal that would take us the better part of a day, maybe a day and a half. We can have three of those done before lunch now. I'm pretty confident that Cena probably saved my life, you know, just being able to talk to the crane operator, you know, say, hey, hold on a minute, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't raise it up so hard or, you know, just that quick chat back and forth, that instantaneous. Ten years ago, you know, we were doing hand signals and, you know, there's always a delayed reaction, but now it's, as soon as you say something, you know, the other person on the other end of the line can hear you, everybody knows what's going on. Yeah, it's definitely changed. It's changed a lot. Even small stuff like integrating everything into Google, you know what I mean? So the Google scheduling and, you know, which is integrated in Google Maps, which is, you know, you can do all the electronic bids through Google Docs. The equipment just takes so much risk factor out of a lot of the jobs. Um, the climbing gear just makes it easier on the climbers every single day. It's, it's amazing what people have you know, how far along we've advanced. It lets you stay in this business for a longer period of time. That's why companies are buying mini loaders and you know, rear mounted elevator buckets and spider lifts and using drones and using all this cool, great technology that we have available to us now. Five years from now, it's going to be amazing what technology is out there. Are you ready to Jambo, baby? So what's going on here is the Jambo claw game. The claw game is one of the best parts about Jambo. We got four climbing systems here. There's a zigzag, there's an akimbo, there's a Blake hitch, and there's a rope runner. And participants will jump up on the pedestal. Jambo man affixes you into the human claw climbing system. Climbers then take themselves from the pedestal out into the prize pit. And there's all these boxes laying around on the ground. You grab that box with your feet. And then they have to use those same four climbing systems to navigate back to get that prize back onto the starting pedestal, just like the claw game that you're used to when you were a kid. If you drop the box, the box doesn't get on the stump or you touch the ground, tough luck. It's a mystery grab. You don't know what you're gonna get. Could be really cool, could be not so cool, but it's Jambo, so it's probably really cool. Could be rocks, could be cups, could be a chainsaw, could be climbing gear. You open it, yeah, see what's inside. I'll come away with something. I don't think you don't really win this game. You just get some cool stuff. I won some clippers, rope bag, a banner. I'll get a box for sure. Come on, man. Come on, man. Jambo Man is here the whole time. Robert Albritton cheering everybody on uh, and helping them through it. Jambo Man, he's got some energy. He's a great guy. This is pretty fun. It's a different experience. I like, you know, swinging around on ropes and stuff, so uh, you know, I'm kind of excited to try it out. Now, who's your best friend in the whole wide world? Jambo Man! So I just played the loader game. It was so much fun. It's articulating in the middle. It's oscillating on the sides. It's tricky. There's tons of buttons, but it's a jam, a jam at Jambo. I've never seen a loader challenge anywhere in any competition that would showcase this set of skills for uh, a person that was not necessarily a climber. The Branch Manager Grapple is a free-floating grapple. That thing is a lifesaver. One of the beauties of the, of the articulating loader or any type of log moving tool is that you can do it on light duty. There's still an opportunity for a person to be a massive impact on a tree crew now. And I think that's why this, this skill is so important to recognize as an important asset. We're going through the obstacle course. You can't break anything, you can't hit the house. You gotta pick up the log, you gotta get up to it, you gotta reverse back, you gotta come back around. It is insane. The loader game looks really fun. I'm really psyched about it. I really am. It looks fun and um, I think uh, I think it'll be great. The grapple is the bee's knees. I would love a grapple. Maybe once I get a crane, I would love to save up for one. I think uh, with the development and innovation of the mini articulating loader, you're going to start seeing more and more of them on, on tree crews. Everywhere you go, they're pretty affordable. Most fun at Jambo. Keep your mouth shut and your ears open. You've got to truly humble yourself every day and realize that 
one bad decision will be your last if it's the wrong one. Never stop learning. Learn and study a good arborist as much as possible. Watch them, watch how they work in a tree. You know, get their two cents, especially in business. That's been the biggest challenge for me is, is finding out that a relative degree of skill will not carry me through, that I needed to be diligent as well about the business side of things. If you haven't already gone to some sort of trade show, competition, whatever, uh, you know, get out and just shake hands with people. You, you'd be amazing. You'd be amazed how welcoming everybody is and how much they want to be there to help you. Uh, it's pretty inspirational. Don't just take one person's advice, you know. Seek out as, as much information as you possibly can. And also realize that it's not a single man sport. This is a team sport. It's a team occupation. And how we interact with each other, and how we make each other feel is just as important as how great you can climb and how wonderful you can rig. You gotta expose yourself to greatness. You know, you you don't 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 settle. If you feel like you're gridlocked and you're not learning, move on and go find somewhere where you can learn and grow, you know. But, that's probably the best advice I can give. Soak it up like a sponge everywhere you can get it. It wasn't that scary. It has tubes and ropes that you have to climb up and try to make it to the top and ring the bell. You gotta use your mind and know what you're doing. So the first section is kind of like big tubes that you have to stand on and bars that you have to pull yourself up on. And then the second section, ropes. And then the third section, more ladders. And then the final section, which becomes the funnest part of them all, the ropes, rope bundles. I thought I did pretty good. Probably could have did better, but did the best I could. My arms got tired when I got to the rope bundle. It's fun, that's for sure. Are you having fun? Yep. Hi, I'm Kale Royer, head party animal at treestuff.com. I'm here to make sure that everyone knows about our Tree Stuff party program. Each month, volunteer arborists from different regions host free recreational climbing events powered by treestuff.com, giving local arborists a chance to meet, hang out, climb, and try out some cool new gear in the trees. Every Tree Stuff party is 100% free, so there's no reason to not bring your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Check our Facebook events page to learn about upcoming Tree Stuff parties, and sign up to be notified when there's a new Tree Stuff party in your neck of the woods at treestuff.com parties. It's all about seeing friends, making new friends, and having fun in the trees. I hope you can make it to a party soon.